go to God and pray. We'll turn over to page 738. 738. Thank <laughs> you. 
Mark page 272 in your song books, 272. I'll be your song. This evening. After you have that, Mark, turn on page 826. Let's stand for singing this song. The Savior calls, I will answer. When he calls for me, I will be here. When the Savior calls, I will answer. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening, I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Somewhere, listening, I'll be somewhere, listening, I'll be somewhere, listening. 
chapter, we have an interesting sequence of events, and we're not going to focus so much on the first half of this chapter, although that would be a good study in and of itself. But we're just going to give sort of a, a background, hit some highlights of verses 1 through 18, and tonight we're going to break this into two main sections, as you can see in your sermon guide. Uh, we're going to take verses 19 through 29 and talk about Jesus' position of honor with the Father, 
And then in the second half, uh, verses 30 through the end of the chapter, verse 47, we're going to talk about Jesus' position of honor in the eyes of the witnesses. And so through all of this, I want you to keep in mind that the heart of this chapter is about authority and how that Jesus has the same authority as God the Father. That's essentially what it boils down to when you look at the arguments that the Lord is making. Uh, this is going to be uh, one of the first major discourses of Jesus Christ found in the book of John. There's many discourses that are, we're going to be going through in this book, but really this is uh, the first main one where he goes on and gives quite a lengthy discourse about the nature of his work and his relationship to his Father. And so if you look at verse 1, it said, in this, uh, After this there was a feast of the Jews, and the Jews went up to Jerusalem. Uh, we're not told what particular feast uh, this may have been. Uh, some have speculated it's the Passover, but it certainly could have been a, a, another feast as well. And many times in the book of John, uh, the events that Jesus uh, participates in uh, surrounds around one of these feasts. And there's usually some sort of significance in that he is fulfilling what that Old Testament feast was looking forward to. But here we're not given the feast, and so we really can't make any such judgments. But here he comes to Jerusalem, and he comes to this place called Bethesda, which was uh, a place by the Sheep Gate, uh, out by the city borders. And uh, in this uh, pool of Bethesda, you had five porches, or five porticos. Uh, that the idea is a portico here is what it means by porch. And so you have this pool. And the common thought back then was when that water got stirred up and it would start to move, they believed that uh, there, was angel, there were angels interacting with that water that miraculously gave it some sort of a healing power. And so there were people that were diseased, who were lame, couldn't walk, paralyzed, various illnesses, who would wait around by the water for it to stir up so they could enter into the water with hopes of being healed. So Jesus approaches this individual uh, who we're told has been uh, lame for 38 years, a very long time, probably uh, the majority of his lifetime. And so here he is waiting by the pool, and Jesus asks him, will you be made whole? Do you, do you want to be uh, healed of your being lame? And then he goes on to say, well, uh, I'd like to, but every time the water gets stirred up, everybody crowds in front of me, so I can't get in, uh, and I, because I can't move very quickly, and so I'm never able to go and receive the healing. And Jesus performs a miracle of healing uh, with this man. He tells him to get up and walk and carry his bed. And he does so. So miraculously, this is a Bible miracle, something that happens instantaneously, uh, not something that can be explained by any other natural means. This is a supernatural, biblical, Jesus-authenticated miracle. And so he heals this man. And then uh, Jesus kind of sits back into the crowd. And what happens is the chief priests and those officials in the synagogue or the uh, temple... They see this fellow, this is on the Sabbath day, and he's carrying his bed. You know, here he was laying on this thing, kind of like a little mat, a little pallet uh, that offered him some padding. But now he was carrying it. And according to their Sabbath laws, not God's Sabbath laws, God's Sabbath laws required that they withstand, uh, withhold from their main course of business. They were not to work generally on that first day, or that, that seventh day of the week, the Sabbath day. But the, uh, these Pharisees added a lot of laws to that. And we talked about some of those laws uh, last week or the week before. We talked about how, uh, how ridiculous it got and to the fervent extent that they took it. They talked about how uh, mirrors were not allowed. A woman was not allowed to look in the mirror because she might be tempted to pluck a gray hair, which they would have considered as being work. So we see how far they push these things, these man-made traditions. And with this, there's no exception. It was one of their man-made laws that to carry a bed or any other large object from one domain to another would be a sin on the Sabbath day, punishable by death. Carrying something from one domain to another would be considered work. Now, the hypocrisy in that was that it was legal to carry the bed if somebody was on it from one room to another. But if you were just carrying the bed to, to move it or to transport it, like this man was doing, from one domain to another, he would have been guilty. So this obviously this aroused some anger with the chief priests, and they start to inquire about this. And then the man tells them, well, the, this man told me to do it. He didn't know Jesus' name at this point. He, he, Jesus had already assimilated back into the crowd. And so now Jesus picks back up and sees this individual in the temple. Apparently... 
this lame man, one of the first things he did once he was healed was to go to the temple to worship. And he bumps into Jesus again. And then in verse 14 it says, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. And so here we see again, Jesus dealing with people's sin. Uh, he, we, we talked about last week how Jesus dealt with the Samaritan woman's sin. He dealt with the problems with Nicodemus' faith. He confronts people in the problems that they have with their spiritual lives. And so apparently he's telling this individual, you, you don't need to be sinning anymore, possibly indicating that the reason he was lame for 38 years possibly could have been because of some sin. You know, some physical consequences are a result of personal sin. That's not always the case, but certainly it is sometimes, and that possibly could have been the case with this, this individual. But nonetheless, that's what Jesus tells him, but now... Upon seeing Jesus again, this man departs and goes back to the Jews whom had, conf whom had confronted him earlier and pointed out Jesus now. Here's Jesus. Here, here he is. Here's the one who made me whole. I couldn't figure out who it was before, but now I found him again. Now, some have suggested that this man sold Jesus out in doing this. The, uh, the, the idea is that man who was healed knew that that group of people was looking for Jesus to take up issue with him. And by tattling, in, in essence, he was giving him up. And so there's one school of thought that says, well, this man is giving Jesus away. And so he's responding negatively to the healing that took place. But on the other side of the coin, it might just be that he was trying to glorify Christ by going and telling what had happened to him and just doing what he thought he was supposed to do. Uh, we can't really tell with any sense of... of, of being able to determine that for sure in this text, but I want to throw that out there. It's interesting, though, that if it's the case that he sold out Jesus, this is in contrast to chapter 9, which we'll talk about when we get there. Chapter 9, 30, and 30, uh, 30 through 34, when Jesus heals a blind man, and the blind man would not well, held to his guns and defended the Lord for what he had done. And so th this, is the, this is the backdrop. And so now the Jews are addressing Jesus. Look at verse 16. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. And sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Uh, it was considered uh, unlawful to perform medicinal uh, services on the Sabbath day unless it was someone's life was in danger. That was the Sabbath law. And so they thought Jesus had violated that. They're now going after him. They're angered by this. And now Jesus addresses them. He says, My father worketh hither unto, and I work. In other words, Yes, when God created the world, he rested on the seventh day. But since that point, it's not as if God was resting on every seventh day of the week like his people were. That law was for the people. So it was common knowledge that, yes, God, you know, God's active in our lives uh, all seven days of the week. It's not as if God takes off on the Sabbath day like we're commanded to. But what Jesus says, well, the Father's working, so do I. He's linking himself with God the Father. He goes on to say in 18, Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. And so Jesus, in the eyes of the Jews, is guilty on two accounts. Number one, saying that he's equal with the Father and that he's able to perform work on the, first, or the seventh day of the week, on the Sabbath. But number two, by calling God his Father in that special relationship type of way, was to claim divinity would be to claim to be God. And so to these people, that was blasphemy. This was the most heinous of crimes that could have been committed in this day. And so now he's got these people riled up, they're stirred up, they're angry, they're ready to kill Jesus. And that's the backdrop for this discourse that begins in verse 19. So let's first notice here, verses 19 through 29... We won't necessarily read every verse, and some of the verses we might go through rather quickly, just because there's a great deal of text uh, we need to bring out. But basically, he's going to make th these arguments that he has the authority of God because it's been given to him. So in this argument, in, this, in these verses 19 through 29, Jesus is making it clear that his mission was not to usurp the Father. The Jews may have thought that. They may have thought that Jesus was trying to come and steal God's thunder or glory or to try to usurp his authority, go up and above him. Jesus is not, that wasn't Jesus' mission. He's going to communicate that. Jesus only operated God's authority in conjunction with God's will. That's going to be important. Jesus had authority in so much as it was God's will. 
Let's notice just one other passage very quickly before we dive into this text. Let's look at Philippians chapter 2, which will serve as a good preface to what we're going to be talking about here in John chapter 5. Look at Philippians chapter 2. This is a pretty uh, familiar passage uh, to many of us, but let's look here at Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 6. Notice here what, what Paul is admonishing the Christians to do. First of all, in verse 5, he's trying to tell them to emulate the example of Christ. In verse 5, he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. In other words, he, he, he has the divine essence. He didn't think it was robbery. He didn't think it was denigrating God to make himself equal with God because he was God. And so he, he goes on to say that. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So in other words, before Jesus came to earth, he was in heaven with God. He was God. John chapter 1 and verse 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But he humbled himself. There was a humiliation. Humiliation, humiliation is to humble oneself. He humbled himself in the form of a, of a man for the purpose of, of course, coming to save us. But he humbled himself. He took upon him the form of a servant. He served others. And then, once he died and was resurrected, he was put back in his status of deity. He says that the Father has exalted him. And so anytime we're talking about Jesus in the flesh, we realize that it's hard to wrap our minds around because on the one hand, yes, he's in the form of a man. He's 100% man. He has all of the characteristics of humanhood. He was tempted in all points just like we are. But on the other hand, he's God. And that's hard for us to, to understand and to comprehend because... There's nobody that has ever come on the scene that is like that. And there will never be anybody like that. So Jesus has an exalted position with the Father. So let's notice here uh, verses 19 and 20. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what so things ever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that you or ye may marvel. So in other words, um, the Son, Christ, couldn't do anything on his own accord. It had to be with the authority of the Father. So he uses the analogy of a father and a son. The Son does the things that he sees the Father do. So Jesus was just doing what... He, he saw the Father do in eternity. He was the perfect expressed image of God in the flesh. We want to know what God is like. We look at Christ. He didn't do anything that was outside of the Father's will. And it talks about the love the Father has for the Son and how the Father showed him all things. And he's going to continue to show him all things. And he's going to do even greater works through the Christ. So here we're going to see in verse 21, the Father and Jesus are both able to control life and give spiritual life. Let's look here at verse 21. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, resurrects the dead, and quickeneth them, or makes them alive, that's what quicken means, even so the Son makes alive, or quickens, who He will. The Father, in the Jewish mind, was the only one who had this type of power over life. The only one who had the power to resurrect individuals from the dead. That power belonged solely to the Father. And so Jesus here is making himself equal to the Father. He's saying, the Father can do that? Well, since I do the things that I see my Father do that are within his will, I do that as well. It's Jesus that has the power of spiritual life. He has the power to uh, raise the dead. He did that on multiple occasions in his earthly ministry. And so attributes that were already designated to only God the Father, Christ is now saying that He as the Son has the same ability. Now also, in the Jewish mind, only God the Father had the right to judge mankind for their actions. That belonged to God the Father only. 
But notice what he's going to say here in verses 22 and 23. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. That's something that he's, uh, I guess you could say, delegated to the Son. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. So here's the point. The Father has given the Son the authority to execute judgment. We're talking about the final judgment. And because he's done that, just like mankind honors the Father, they need to honor the Son likewise. They're equal. They both are worthy of honor. So God has committed to Christ the right of judgment. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, we're, we're, we're reminded of the fact that we're all going to be judged, but it's called the judgment seat of Christ. We shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So Christ has been given the right to judgment. And because Christ is judge, it will be by his words that he judges mankind. It won't be anything outside the will of the Father. It will be by the words. John 12, 48. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. They which have done good to the resurrection of life, they which have done good to the resurrection of damnation. That's John 5, uh, 29, uh, 28, 29. But let's look at John 12, 48 as well. Look at John 12, 48, when we learn the standard by which we'll be judged. John chapter 12 and verse 48. It says, He that rejects me and receives not my words has the one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him on the last day. It's by the word of God that we'll be judged. And so in that sense, Christ is judging us because we're judged by his words that he's spoken that we have recorded for us in the New Testament. So because Christ is judge, it will be his words that judge mankind. Now there's some other passages in scripture that refer back to this idea of Christ being judged. Uh, for one, it's Hebrews chapter 2. I mentioned earlier that Christ was fully human. He experienced every temptation, every fleshly uh, desire, everything that we experience by virtue of our being humans. He did that while he was in the flesh, but yet he was sinless. <clears throat> Hebrews 2, 17 and 18 says, Therefore... He had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. And that brings us a level of comfort. We're not being judged by somebody who doesn't know what we go through. This text tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, 17 and 18, that because he went through those things, he had to go through those things so he could know what we go through, so that he would be an impartial and a fair judge. Now, also in Romans chapter 14 and verse 11, the text tells us that, uh, Paul tells us that it will be to Christ that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to God. So nobody will able, uh, be able to dispute his or her eternal destiny. It's not as if we're going to get in the judgment day and be able to argue and persuade God one way or the other. The time for that will be passed. It will be based upon our actions according to God's word. So Christ is the impartial judge. We won't be able to dispute our eternal destiny. Now, look here uh, at verse uh, 20. Uh, let's see. Look at verse 24. <coughs> verily, verily, again, I say unto you, he that heareth my word. Here we go. Back to the words. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me, God the Father, has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. <clears throat> so here we're talking about the condition set forward for us to possess eternal life. In a nutshell. This isn't the only verse in the Bible that talks about uh, what is required for us to, uh, to partake in eternal life, but we learn a great deal from this passage. First of all, the hearing, the verb tense here implies that it's a continued action. This isn't talking about a one-time hearing about the gospel, and this is talking about a continuous process. Yes, we, we hear it for the first time, but we're continually coming to His Word, hearing Him, listening to Him, hearkening to His Word. So this hearing implies a continued attitude of doing so. And one also must believe, has to believe in the one that has sent him. One definition I saw for, the, the, for this term belief here would be the intellectual conviction 
so what we believe, the conviction about what we believe, but also conjoined with the willingness to trust Christ and also conjoined with the determination to obey. This isn't just some sort of a mental ascent thing where we hear the word one time and we say we believe it, say some little prayer, and then we're safe for the rest of our lives. That's not what's being said here. This is talking about a person who continually comes to the Word of God, who humbly submits to it, who believes it intellectually, is convicted by it, now is decided to obey and trust Christ. Joyful trust conjoined with obedience is a good definition for biblical belief, biblical faith. And the, t the text tells us that the person who does those things has eternal life. There's a sense in which believers, Christians nowadays, have eternal life that belongs to us. Now, I could say, would be a true statement as well, that it's possible for a person once having the promise of eternal life to walk away from that and reject it and lose that, walk outside of God's grace, that's possible. But there's a sense in which if we're doing these things, if we're faithful, if we're abiding in the blood of Christ, we have eternal life. As long as we are still completing those conditions, hearing and believing Christ. Uh, this is a present reality, but also a future hope. We don't have our eternal salvation in reality until the judgment day, but we have it so sure now that it can be said that we possess it. Uh, Brother Guy in Woods, uh, one of the uh, famous restoration, restoration preachers of this, uh, this past century in the 1900s. Here's how he kind of summarized what Christ is saying here in this verse, in verse 24. He said, He that keeps on hearing my word and keeps on believing on him who has sent me has eternal life so certainly that it may be contemplated as already coming to pass and it absolutely must ensue in virtue of the unalterable law of God's promises. In other words, basically everything that we just said, but also throwing in that if God promises something, that's unalterable. That's indestructible. It's a promise that we can rest upon with every single assurance, trust, and hope of our entire being. It can't change. God's promises are sure. And so the person who keeps on hearing, keeps on believing, the intellectual part, the trust part, and the obeying part is going to has eternal life in prospect, so sure, because we have the promise that we're going to be saved in the judgment. We also get quite a bit of detail here about the resurrection, don't we? Look at verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, into which all who are in the graves, looking forward to the second coming, will hear his voice and come forth. They which have done good to the resurrection of life, and they which have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So I just want to make a few points regarding the resurrection. The resurrection will take place at the same time the Lord comes back. That time of which we don't know when it will be. It will be there will be a resurrection. Those who are living at that time will be changed, but those who have already died will be resurrected. They're going to be brought to life. And it, both the good and the wicked are going to be resurrected at the same time. There are some false doctrines out there amongst our denominational friends that would teach that when Christ comes back the first time, the righteous will be raised, and they're going to go to heaven with him for a thousand years, during, or, or, uh, during which time the unrighteous who died will not be resurrected until the, the second time he comes back. The second, second time, I guess you could say. So in other words, they put a thousand year gap between the time that the righteous are raised, resurrected from the dead, and when the unrighteous or the wicked are raised from the dead. But here this text tells us that they occur at the same time. When Christ comes back, that is all there is. So the righteous will be resurrected to life, to eternal life, to heaven. And those who have done evil, those who have not done the things prescribed by Christ to obey the gospel, to the resurrection of condemnation, or the resurrection of damnation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9 tells us at that time, Christ is going to come in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not the Lord. That's what's going to happen to those individuals who are outside of Christ. And that's something we have to take very seriously. Jesus has the authority to make such a statement. So, here in verses 19 through 29, we see that Jesus' position of honor has a position of honor with the Father. And His authority has been given to Him by the Father. All the things that have been attributed to the Father, the fact that He can give life, He has control over life, the fact of the, uh, the resurrection, uh, the judgment, all those things that have been thought to belong to God the Father, now 
we're told that Jesus has the same authority. So Jesus has the authority to execute those things. Now, Jesus is going to give some proofs about how he can make such a statement. It'd be one thing to make those claims, but it's another thing to back it up and to prove it. And in fact, under the law of Moses, you have to give two or three witnesses uh, in, the, in the courts for your testimony to, to even be able to hold up. Uh, you can learn that from Deuteronomy 17.6 and 19.15. And so, according to the old law, one must present at least two or three witnesses to prove one's case legally, and Jesus is going to do just that. And the first, he, he brings forth really four witnesses, depending on how you divide this up. In the first place, he mentions John the Baptist. John the Baptizer. John the Baptizer's ministry was to make straight the way of the Lord, to prepare the way of the kingdom of Christ, and he bore witness of the Son of Christ. That was his primary responsibility. Notice verses 33 through 35. It says, Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness of the truth. And I received not the testimony of man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. So he's attesting to the truthfulness of John's message. Uh, God attested to the truthfulness of John's witness. Now he said that John was a, a burning and a shining light. Now what he's referring to here is one of the old oil lamps, the Herodian oil lamps. And I had the opportunity to actually hold a 2,000 year old Herodian oil lamp in my hands at a, 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 a museum of biblical history. And it could fit in the palm of your hand. You would have to fill it with oil and you would put in uh, so, some, some wick or whatever they would burn in it, and you would burn it, and it produced a little light, and people would put those up in their houses at that time, all over the house, and that's how they generated light. And so you had this little light that gave some light, some benefit. Jesus is calling John the Baptist that light. He wasn't the light, but he had a little light that was bearing witness to the light to come. So he bore witness to the truth. That's witness number one. Witness number two is Jesus' divine works. Verse 36 says, But I have greater witness than that of John. So he's going from the lesser to the greater. I have a greater witness for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me and the Father that has sent me. The very fact that Jesus could perform miracles, that he could take somebody who had been lame for 38 years and just speak him well, was an attestation, a witness that he was from God, that he was who he said he was. In the sermon, the first sermon, the gospel sermon after Christ was resurrected on the first day of Pentecost, the day the church was established, that uh, the, uh, the doors to the kingdom were opened, Peter starts off his sermon by saying, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. The purpose of Jesus' miracles, wonders, and signs was to be an attestation, a proof, a witness that he was from God. That's witness number two. Witness number three is the Father himself. Verse 37 has, says, And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. So the Father is witness number three. But probably the witness that he elaborates on the most and is going to bring us to the end of the chapter is the witness of the scriptures themselves. The Pharisees, the chief priests, the scribes, they were people who prided themselves on knowing the Bible better than anybody else. They knew the scriptures, and they, they, were, they, they were the authorities. And you know what? They, they did know the scriptures. They knew what they said, but they failed to see the point. And Jesus is going to draw that out here when he brings this witness to the forefront. And so the last witness he's going to bring forth is, this, is the scriptures themselves. He's going to point to the entirety of the Old Testament in general, but Moses' writings in particular. So let's notice here in verse 38. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom ye have sent, him ye believe not. That would have been a major, major, major criticism and a slap in the face to these people who thought that they were the ones that had the word dwelling in them. They thought they knew the Old Testament better than anybody. And here you have Jesus saying, you do not have the word abiding in you. It's not in you. Because if it was abiding in you, you would have recognized me, basically. You would have recognized the one my father has sent. But they didn't. They missed the whole point of the scriptures they claimed to reverence so much. He says in verse 39, search the scriptures, or some translations say, ye search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. 
But they are they which testify of me. They thought that they had eternal life because they were the physical Jews. They had the Old Testament scriptures. They knew that scripture better than anybody. But he's saying that they're the things which testify of me. If you knew the Bible as well as you thought you did, you would see that, that all these prophecies, all of these types, all of these things looking forward, you would recognize that it's talking about me. I'm here, but you don't recognize me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Their hearts were hard. They refused to come to Christ even after this discourse. They couldn't see it. He says, I receive not honor from men, but I know you that you have not the love of God in you. They were very concerned about being men-pleasers. They gloried in each other. They probably gave each other uh, numerous accolades and uh, boasted each other up. They were men-pleasers. But he says, that's not, my, that's not what I am. I'm not a man-pleaser. I'm here to please God. You don't have the love of God in you. Verse 43, I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. You'll receive somebody over here coming in, coming in his own name, but here I am, the Son of God, coming by my Father's authority, and you won't receive me. Clearly highlighting their hypocrisy. Back during this time, if somebody was an agent sent by another, a messenger, that person was legally able to operate on behalf of the sender insofar as it was within the will of the sender. So to reject the messenger, to reject the agent, was be this, would be equally, legally, the same thing as rejecting the sender. They were rejecting Christ, the one that was telling them this message. And by doing so, they were rejecting the Father, who they claimed to reverence so much. How can you believe, which receive honor one of another, and seek not an honor that cometh from God only? How can you believe? How can you possibly believe in me if all you're concerned about is honoring men and not God? But now he really digs in. Here, here's how this chapter ends. Do not think that I will accuse you to my father. He's saying, look, I've said a lot of things. I've given you a lot to think about. You're probably raging mad. Don't think I'm going to go to my father and accuse you. Why? Because they were already accused. There is one that accuses you. Even Moses, in whom you trust. Man, Moses was there. That was, that was the individual. They looked, that was their forefather. That was the one they gloried in. They thought that by their being associated with Moses that they were saved. But Jesus is telling them, Moses has condemned you already. Why? For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Many of the Jews thought that Moses would be their intercessor before God. That he would be their stand between, between uh, the Jews and God. Moses went from being their intercessor to their prosecutor. They stood condemned because they missed the whole point of the law of Moses. They missed the whole point of all the writings Moses had. Moses uh, was attributed as of writing uh, the whole Pentateuch, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They missed it. And Jesus is calling that to attention. And so let, 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 let's kind of wrap this up and let's talk about kind of what has been said. Because Jesus has said a lot in these verses. And I could probably do them justice in one sermon. I hope that everybody will go back and read these and study them further. But in this idea, in this discourse by the Lord, Jesus affirms his deity. He has claimed and has been given the power to bestow eternal life. Judgment has been given to him as the Son of God. The resurrection will occur at the second coming. That's what we talked about in that first section. Also, he evidenced his claims by four witnesses. We talked about the witness of John the Baptist. We talked about the witness of his miracles, his signs and his wonders. We talked about the witness of the Father. But we talked about also the witness of the Old Testament scriptures. They all point forward to him as a witness. Now, what are some applications from this that you and I can draw besides all of the truth that we need to be learning about the nature of Christ? Remember, this series is called The Jesus You Need to Know. There are many misconceptions about who Jesus is out there in the world, and if you listen to all them, you're going to have a completely skewed picture of who the Lord is and what He came to do. But we go to the book of John, because one of the main purposes of the book of John is to tell us exactly who Christ is by looking at His own words. So what do we learn about Christ? We learn that Jesus gives enough evidence 
Now, there are some people who say, if I just had one more piece of evidence, I would believe. No, they wouldn't. Jesus has given us all the possible evidence we need. He has evidenced his claims in a sufficient way that we can have all the evidence we need to believe that he is the Son of God. He gives enough evidence. We also learn from this text that it's possible, it's possible to miss Jesus in the Scriptures, just like those Jews did. They read those scriptures, they knew them, but they completely missed the point of them. So it's possible for one to miss Jesus in the scriptures. And they put more stock in their traditions than they did in the living word of God that was standing right before them. It's possible for someone to do. The key theme is that Jesus has all authority. That's what it's all about. He has the same authority as the Father. Giving the Great Commission after he was resurrected, what did he say? All authority, all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Jesus has all authority. We serve the heavenly king. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what must we do to come into that kingdom? Jesus talked about it already in this very discourse. We have to hear his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We have to keep on hearing his word. Keep on being willing to hearken to his instructions. Once we hear, we have a decision whether or not we're going to believe what is set forth. If we're going to believe the witness. We're either going to decide that it's not true and we're not going to believe it, or we're going to accept it and believe it. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We have to then repent of sin. It doesn't stop there. We have to repent. Change our lifestyle. You know, we can't have Jesus without the change. He wants to transform us. You know, I read a quote a little earlier that God formed us, sin deformed us, Jesus wants to transform us. He wants to transform us, and that means we have to change. That's required. That's repentance. Paul said that's required for all men, Acts 17, 30, and 31. We must confess what we believe in our heart with our mouths unto salvation, Romans 10, 9, and 10. And then we're baptized. We come in contact with the precious blood of Christ, humbly submitting to his commandments, being washed of our sins, coming up to walk in the newness of life, a new person, a new creature in the sight of God. And so if there's anybody here that has not obeyed the gospel, we encourage you to do that very thing, to at least consider what God has said about the matter. If we can help you to do that, let us know. We want to study with you. If there's anybody here that has obeyed the gospel, but you walked away from your Lord, you need to come back, you need to repent, you need to make something right, you need prayers of the congregation. If you have any spiritual need, we're going to send, stand and all sing an invitation song. If you do that at this time, please come forward if you have any spiritual need. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, I still will follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow.